Again, welcome to Freedom Church International. It's good to have you be here today, and to those of you who are watching online, thanks so much for tuning in. We are really glad to have you be a part of worship in that way. You know, in life and in history, there are a few pivotal moments that come along in our lifetimes where things turn, where things really do pivot. They're hinge points in history. They're hinge points in our lives. And in life, a lot of those are very predictable. They're not surprising. There are some that you could almost script that become real hinge points for you, things like when you got to the age that you moved out on your, first, on your own for the first time or when you got married or when you had kids. Those were real pivotal moments, weren't they? I mean, life had been going one way and, and had looked a certain way, and when those events happened, life looked and felt differently, didn't it? There are several things like that that come along when you reach a point where your kids have all moved out and you have the empty nest or you retire. Those are, are hinge points where life takes a different direction. History will do the same thing. We, we see times when things made a real pivotal turn. And when we look at the Gospels, it's interesting to see, particularly in the Gospels and in Acts, what some of those pivot points were, what some, what some of those hinge moments were where things took a real turn. In Jesus' time on earth, it's very obvious that one of the big hinge points was when Jesus was 30 years old. He had been on earth for 30 years, but he was living in the shadows. But when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, which meant that the ministry of the forerunner was over and it was time for the ministry of the Messiah now to step fully into the spotlight, he stepped out of the shadows and he began to preach and he began to perform miracles and to usher in the kingdom. And so, you know, that's a real pivot point in history. But for the disciples who are now called to follow Jesus, it's interesting to see the turning points for them. It, it felt like for a season, I would imagine that it felt like for them that they had sort of found a pattern even in the unique nature of every day involved in following Jesus, but at least they had fallen into a pattern where they knew that even though Jesus was unpredictable and every day was different, the part that was predictable was it all just revolved around Jesus, right? Just be a spectator. Just watch what Jesus does and stay as close to Jesus as you can, and it's going to be good. And so they learned to do that, and they continued in that for some extended period of time, and it's like, okay, we we can't quite figure out what he's doing here, but we just want to be close to it while he's doing it. But then they hit another of those major pivot points where Jesus said to them, I want you to go, you two to this city, you two to this city. And he splits them up. He does this a couple of different times. He does it with the 12, and he does it at another time with 70 who are following him, two by two. And he says, here's what I want you to go and do now. I want you to do the same things that you've seen me do. When you encounter sick people, I want you to heal them. When you encounter the demon possessed, I want you to cast out the demons, and I want you to teach and preach the message of the kingdom of God. Can you imagine how overwhelming that was? Don't you know they all wanted to go, time out, whoa, 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 back up the train, Jesus. That's not what we're doing here. That is not what we do. See, Jesus, we get up in the morning, and we get excited about going to see what you're going to do, and that's fun all day long. We just get to watch what Jesus does, but that's how this works, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, it's a new phase. You're going out, and now you're going to do the things that I've done. And I can just imagine these pairs of people going in all these different directions. And as they're walking, they're shaking their heads and going, this is not going to work. This is not. You know this isn't going to work. Jesus isn't here. How are we going to help any of these people? And then a short while later, we get the picture of them coming back. And they are on cloud nine. And they're all saying, you're not going to believe this, Jesus. You are not going to believe what happened. The same stuff that you have done, we can now do. It's crazy. They've entered a new phase where they're no longer spectators watching Jesus do the impossible. They are now a part of actively ushering in the kingdom. They have now connected with the mission of Jesus. And so now they're in this phase where they spend most of their time in the company of Jesus, but they get sent out at different times to do the work of Jesus. And so it's, it's, it's a different season, but now they're owning more of it, and it's so much more exciting that they're beginning to see 
it's not just that we're spectators. We are participants in this thing of ushering in the kingdom, whatever that means. And then we get one other huge hinge point, and it comes in Acts 2. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, everything just blows up to a whole other level. And now it's no longer one tight little pack that's following Jesus and sent out from time to time on short-term missions where they go in pairs and do the work of God and then run back to Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit has washed over them, has filled them, and now every single one of them are fully empowered and fully engaged to be on mission for Jesus every day, and they are walking in power. They are walking in fullness. Wherever they go, it is just as if Jesus himself showed up. Power on display, sickness healed, deliverance from de demonic oppression, and the message of the kingdom is delivered with power. The world begins to be transformed from, from that point forward. Can you see and appreciate those moments that change the direction, that were really a, a, a major hinge point? I believe that what we have witnessed is sort of the equivalent of that happening in Freedom Church. We are living in a really amazing, unique season, and I don't want us to miss this. I was talking with our leadership team about this before our prayer time this morning. With all of just the, the craziness of the last year and a half, it would be easy to overlook the scope of what God is doing, just this, the scale of, of what God is doing in Freedom Church. And I want to just try and define and give some context for what I believe we're witnessing happening here and see the parallel between what I just described in the Gospels. I'm not trying to be dramatic when I say this. I'm trying to just give you it for, because some of you, a lot of you, many in the room and watching online, haven't been with us for a very long time, and you may not have a lot of perspective about this church, but two years ago at this time, we were at a pretty scary place in the life of the church. A lot of you who were here didn't realize what a challenging season we were in at the time. We were still doing the things that we had done since the church was birthed. We were doing the mostly healthy, right stuff. And the church wasn't growing. If anything, it was slowly declining in attendance. Financially, we had been at a healthy place. We were in a, you know, we'd gotten into this place. But suddenly, starting a few months prior to two years ago, boy, things began to decline financially in a big way. And by the fall of two years ago, I mean, we were at a place, we were trying to figure out what on earth is going on. This is, this is really a tight spot to be in. And then something happened. It was one of those pivotal moments. In the middle of that situation, God spoke. And as a church, we said yes to what God was calling us to. The, the defining thing, I believe, that happened in that season is that God spoke very clearly to us and said, it is time for you to move to a different phase. It's not enough for you just to be a sweet little huddle of people who love Jesus and who love each other and who get together and worship and pray for each other. It is time for you as a church to now step out and really get as a church on mission. And God gave some clear definition to that about ministries that we were to partner with and immediately begin to sow financially into and that we as a church right then were supposed to embrace the call to get busy planting new churches in Africa. It didn't make any sense from a, an earthly perspective. We, we were like, we're, we're a little bit of a dwindling congregation here, and financially we're dwindling quickly. We, Lord, we don't have any margin to invest in other ministries or, or to go out and plant other congregations. From a, it, Just in the natural, it didn't make any sense at all, and God spoke very clearly, I'm calling you now to engage in the mission. And we said, okay, we'll do that. And as we stepped into that season, it was really about 18 or 20 months ago when we did, that's when COVID hit. That's when everything got crazy. And suddenly we couldn't even get together to have church. It's like, what bizarre timing. We can't even see each other at the moment that we're called to a whole new phase of really stepping into the mission that God has for us. And yet... I want you to, to just look at the comparison. 18 or 20 months ago, we were a, a church that was running 
110 to 125 in attendance on Sunday morning. We had four small groups. We had one discipleship group meeting at that time. That was a year and a half ago. Four small groups, one discipleship group, usually 110 or 120 people. Here we are a year and a half later. I'm not suggesting by any means we've arrived at anything, but I just want you to notice the comparison. A year and a half later, Freedom Church has three campuses meeting on two continents. On a normal Sunday, more than 700 people in attendance. The Fairhope campus alone has seven small groups, seven discipleship groups, and way beyond any numerical stuff that we could report, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is taking place in such a way that lives are being radically changed. People are being healed. People are being set free. People are being baptized. People are being baptized into the work and fullness of the Holy Spirit. I I hear reports back. It's not just that groups are getting together and people are meeting. Every one of those groups that I just described, these seven small groups, these seven discipleship groups on top of that, Every single one of them. I keep hearing reports week after week. You're not going to believe what the Holy Spirit did this week. You're not going to believe what we saw happen this week. How the Spirit moved. When we had communion this week, we just got to tell you, the Spirit of God showed up. Amazing stuff is happening. People are being touched and changed. You know what's happening? We have stepped into another phase. A year and a half ago, we stepped into this thing that is happening. And it's not that we earned it. It's not that we figured out some plan. We were called to embrace the mission of God for us as a church collectively. And guess what happens when you do that? There's fruit that comes from that. And we've been enjoying that. Wouldn't you agree that there's a significant change from a year and a half ago to now? And lo and behold, it's been a while all this other craziness has gone on around us and people are trying to figure out how to survive. And here we are trying to figure out what's God got next because it's such a good season. It goes back to a pivotal moment when we said yes to God's call to step into the the mission that he had for us. To me, it's a lot like that season when Jesus said, okay, it's time for you to stop just huddling around me and it's time for you to step into the mission. Okay, that's a new phase couple of years later, when the Spirit of God fell on each of those followers of Jesus, they stepped into a whole other dimension. 2021 is our equivalent to that. We have seen the Holy Spirit being poured out on us as a people in Fairhope, in Sapala, in Eda. And right now, I mean, this, this month... We are in this season that God has been preparing us for where he says, okay, as a body, you embrace the call to be on mission, and you're doing that. We are doing that. That's a really good thing. It hasn't ended. It is it's just beginning, but we're walking in that, and we're seeing the fruit of that. But on top of that, now the reason the Spirit of God is poured out in such a way on us is because God is speaking and is saying, it's not just that you are called collectively to be on mission, but I'm calling every single one of you now to operate in the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that you uniquely walk in the mission that God has for your life. And I want to tell you, as we say yes to this, there is a whole other dimension of living and fruitfulness that we get to walk into, and it is good. Somebody say amen. Amen. Don't you want that? Don't you want to walk in that fullness? And that's what this is all about. These five weeks that we are pressing into, where we're talking about missional living, we're no longer thinking in terms of what are we going to get together to do collectively. We're already embracing that. What we're saying is every single one of us have ministry opportunities and have callings that we have to step into. And so for five weeks, we're looking at five fundamental behaviors, five habits and rhythms that become a track for us to run on as a missional people. As we go from being a people who are just like millions and millions of other just good church-going Christians who just have a good, healthy routine of go to church, just be a good person, be a good neighbor, pray for the community, and hopefully somewhere in that somebody will get helped and God will be honored. Where we're saying, there's more to it than that. 
the Spirit of God has more planned than us just being a good people and hopefully something rubs off on somebody else. No, there's more to the mission than that. What does that look like? Could it be something more than trying to, to pin somebody in a corner in a moment of time so that we can give them a track and tell them how they need to be saved and give them the gospel and in just a moment of time try and force them to cross the line? Could there be a mission that is bigger than that? And what we're realizing from the gospels is that the answer is yes, absolutely. And we've said the heart of this mission is just very clearly laid out in the gospels that it is to declare, to announce to everyone around us the arrival of the kingdom of God, but to also introduce them to what that looks like. To introduce them to the righteous, just, generous reign of God in the lives of people and how that spills over onto all of us in the community of faith. The arrival of the kingdom of God and the announcement of that. That's our mission. And we looked at the last two weeks, two different specific missional habits that go with that. The first one is... That we agree together that every one of us need to look for opportunities. We set as a goal that every week that we would seek to identify three different people that we will bless. Not just this week, but three people every week that we bless by the words of affirmation that we speak, by the acts of service that we do for them, or by gifts that we give to them. All of those designed to strengthen their arm, to lighten their load, to build them up. First habit, bless at least three people, at least one within the community of faith, at least one outside the community of faith. The second one that we talked about last week is using meal times and the table time as an opportunity for ministry. Once again, a goal of three, that we would develop the rhythm and habit of connecting with at least three people per week, at least one from inside the church, at least one from outside the church, where we take the time to get across the table to open up and share life with, with the goal of really building bonds of connection because the kingdom and ministry re really happens along the lines of meaningful relationships. So here we are, two weeks and two habits into this. And if I could just paint with a broad brush, I would make this observation. The extroverts are having a good time so far. <laughs> and the introverts are squirming and uncomfortable. Would you agree with that? The extroverts are going, hey, if this is what the kingdom is about, I can do this. You're telling me to talk to people, call people, check on people, bless people, have meals with people. If I'm an extrovert, I'm like, hey, I'm loving this kingdom of God stuff. The, the versions of expanding the kingdom that were all about, you got to get somebody to sit down and listen to the gospel message, overwhelmed a lot of people with the idea of, I could just actually have a meal with somebody and seek to encourage somebody. That could be my kingdom calling. Yeah, I can do that. The extroverts are loving that, and the introverts are going, if you give me three more weeks of stuff like that to do, I'm finding another church to go to, right? I mean, the introverts are hating this. And I mean, it's funny to hear some of you coming back to me and say, how many did you say? i got to eat with three people this week? I get it. I get it. Hey, for the introverts, today is for you. <laughs> today is good news, and we're going to flip the script. I'm warning you extroverts, and yes, I, I'm more the extrovert. Extroverts, now it's going to be more of a challenge for us. I'm going to go ahead and warn you in advance what we're going to press into today. When you put this into practice, there are going to be times you're going to be squirming. This is all going to balance out. As we do these things together, Oh, it's going to help us to live on mission every day. Let's press into that. We're going to start with two passages of Scripture, both revolving around Jesus. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, feel free to do so, but it's in your outline. If you want to pull your outlines out, we're going to start in John chapter 5. There's this wonderful, beautiful story that's told in John 5 at the opening of that chapter where Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda. This is a, a place in Jerusalem that... We won't take time to really unpack this, but we don't know whether it was something that actually happened over time or if it's something that, that, that there was a legend about. And I'm not questioning the authority of Scripture when I say this. There are just two verses in this passage which don't exist in some of the oldest manuscripts, and we don't know if like a later editor added those couple of verses in to explain the sort of the tradition or the legend or if it's something that had actually happened. And I don't care what your opinion is about this, so just, just don't get hung up on that. 
But the, the reason that people gathered at the pool, whether this, like I said, whether these things had actually happened or they'd just been told to expect them to happen, we're, we're unclear, but was because of the stories that have been told about how an angel would visit this pool periodically and would stir the waters and the first person to get into the waters after they had been stirred would be cured of whatever their malady was. And like I said, the two verses that, that tell that part are, are not in most of the old manuscripts, so we don't know if that actually happened or if that was just the story of what to expect to happen. So the result was, for years and years, people with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities, they would be brought to the pool and essentially left there all day, every day, because you don't know what day the angel might show up. So they're all just coming Maybe it's a long shot, but maybe today's the day. Maybe I could be the first one. And so you can just imagine how, in some ways, it's, uh, it's probably a discouraging place to be because you can imagine that day after day, month after month, when you've been with all these other people who've got needs and you don't get cured, how discouraged you get by that. Well, so you've got quite a crowd of sick and disabled people who are there each day. And on a particular day that Jesus comes, there is a man who has been crippled for 38 years who somebody, his friends or family, bring him every day, put him on his mat by the pool. And Jesus comes up to the man. Out of all the people who are there, you can only imagine the massive number of problems. And Jesus picks out this one guy. And he asks him the simplest, most straightforward question. Do you want to be well? And it's interesting, the guy's response. Because, you know, we would think, dude, when Jesus looks at you and says, do you want to be well, there's only one right answer. Yes! Yes, I want to be well. And he doesn't say that. He, he answers in a way that if we're honest, we can really identify with. Instead of with a heart that's expectant and hopeful, saying, yes, I want to be well, believing that today's going to be the day, he speaks the way that a lot of us speak when we, come, when we have an encounter with Jesus. And he gives the excuse for why he doesn't even have any hope of being well today. Because he basically says, well, pff, I mean, how could I be well today? I mean, the whole thing is a contest to see if the angel were to show up today and stir the water, it's all a contest to see who the first one is who can get in the water. And guess what, Jesus? Nothing works from here down. I'm not going to win any race. I'm not going to get to the water ahead of anyone. So why are you asking me, do I want to be well today, is essentially what his response was is so intriguing it's not like some big faith response i mean wouldn't you agree it's a pretty lousy response i mean if we're looking for the what a man of faith he's believing god for the impossible it's about the lousiest response you could give he is explaining to jesus why the very thing that jesus is offering ain't going to happen today and instead of jesus going well i hate it for you dude because i was about to do something really good for you but you sorry you had the wrong answer you didn't bring any real faith to the equation, so sorry. Your opportunity is going to pass you by. That's not what he gets at all. In spite of this rather weak response, Jesus says, take up your mat and go home. Today's your day. And he just releases power to heal the man. A guy who hasn't walked for 38 years in a moment of time. His legs are completely restored he hops up. He rolls up his mat. I can only imagine. He is high-stepping. He is jumping. He is, his mind is blown. And the Pharisees are there watching. You know who they are. I mean, they're, they're the spiritual Gestapo. They are the, the Jewish blue hair mafia that is just looking for an opportunity to get offended. And guess what they're offended at? He did it on the Sabbath, the holy day. Jesus, you have done the work of healing a man on the Sabbath. That is against the rules. And they even go a step further. This guy that they've been walking past for 38 years, haven't lifted a finger to help him. You know what they say to him? Shame on you. You rolled up your mat and carried it. That is work on the Sabbath. You are in violation of the law. Can you imagine? I mean, don't you know Jesus is just slapping his forehead and rolling his eyes? Are you kidding me? 
This man has been crippled his entire life. You've been walking by him day after day. You haven't had anything to offer him. And on the day, the best day of his life, you're ticked because he's carrying his mat under his arm. Boy, religious people can be some sad folks, can't we? Good night. When Jesus shows up and he does something and he does it outside of our box, we can get offended over the silliest stuff. Jesus, you healed on the Sabbath. And cripple guy, you're carrying your mat on the Sabbath. They are so offended over this. The poor cripple guy, he doesn't know what to say. He's just doing what Jesus told him to do. He said, get up and go home and take your mat with you. So he points out who has done this. We pick up in verse 16 where it says, So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, and so am I. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son. And shows him everything that he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. I love this, this little deal that Jesus says back to them. He doesn't argue with them. He doesn't get drawn into a fight. They're mad about what he's done on the Sabbath. Because you can't do any work on the Sabbath. we got a bunch of rules about this. And Jesus I mean, they, they repeatedly try and trip him up on this, about all that you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, can we just be clear about this? The Father's always at work. Since Eden, the Father's been at work. He's been at the, what, what's been his work, by the way? His work has been to usher the kingdom of God here on earth so that men and women, boys and girls, who have been separated from the kingdom of God can be restored to it. The kingdom of God was on earth in Genesis. In the opening part of Genesis, Adam and Eve were living in the kingdom of God in perfect fellowship with each other and with God, and life was fantastic. From the time that sin entered the world, they were separated from the kingdom, and the Father immediately set about. He went to work to restore mankind and to usher them back into the kingdom. And Jesus said, let's be clear. That is not a six-day-a-week job. The Father has been on task seven days a week for thousands of years, every day working to usher the kingdom of God in so that people could once again be restored to this place, to this relationship where they experience the love and compassion of God, the generosity of God, the justice of God, the joy of living in the family of God. And I want to be clear, it's not just the Father who's been at work seven days a week. I've been at work seven days a week to do this. And then in explaining what that work looks like, he sort of defined how he lived and did ministry every day of his life. He said the Son, speaking of himself, only does what he sees his father doing because the son can do nothing by himself. I need for you to let that sink in. This is Jesus. He is the creator of everything. He spoke everything into existence. The scripture says he holds everything in place and in motion by his spoken powerful word. Jesus is talking. And when Jesus is in the flesh, he said, I want you to be clear, I can't do anything on my own. I can only do the things that I see my Father doing, and that's what I step into. That's what I press into. What's the significance of that? Well, let's bring it down to real practical terms. Jesus walked into an environment where he was surrounded by all kinds of needy people. Every direction he looked, it was people in need. Now, here's a really perplexing thing about the Gospels, and this troubles us. We, we struggle. When it, when it actually works its way into our lives, this is one of the most troubling things about how we relate to God. There are places that Jesus would go where only a handful of people would be healed or delivered, and there are other places that the Gospels record where Jesus would go where everyone in town 
who was sick, who was disabled, who had demonic possession or oppression, would be healed or set free. And there's no real clarification given as to why a few got it and others didn't and another community were all healed. On this day when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda, one crippled man was made well. And every other blind person, every other crippled person, every other person with a withered arm or whatever condition went to bed that night with the same problem they woke up with. Now from our perspective, we look at that and go... I don't understand. And, and in the name it and claim it camp, what we want to say is, well, the thing that's very clear is one man had faith to be healed that day and every, no one else had the faith. And on that I say, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. Or else I don't know how to read the scriptures because there was nothing about this guy's response that was full of faith. If anything, he didn't give a faith response. He gave a I don't expect anything response. And Jesus healed him anyway. So why on earth did Jesus heal this man? I have no earthly idea except for the one thing that Jesus said. It was what the Father had planned for that day. And this is the part we get so uncomfortable with, that a sovereign God gets to decide on what day unbelievable things will happen. And we don't want it to be that way. We want to go, no, if I believe enough, if I pray the right prayer, if I bring enough, woo enough spiritual oomph to it it's going to happen for me today i want to control that and the truth of the matter is there are some things that only sovereign god controls and we don't like that do we it's okay to say no we don't like it what jesus is acknowledging is i don't get to just walk in here and say everybody in the right hand section bam you all got it you ready in the middle section whoosh all of you are healed and set free. Left side, are you ready? Now you've all got it. He didn't get to do it that day. Now, there were towns where everybody got it, not at the Pool of Bethesda that day. One guy is going to get it that day. How does he know that? Who decides that? Jesus said the Father does. You want to know what I do every day? I just walk in the things that the Father shows me that he has for that day. And that's where the supernatural happens. Because on my own, I can't do anything supernatural. I have the Holy Spirit living in me, and I can't do anything miraculous until the Father reveals through the Holy Spirit what He wants to do that day. And then when I press into that thing, the amazing happens. Even when somebody gives such a sucker response, such a, a, a disappointing response. <laughs> I remember, I think I've shared this before, but I remember reading a, a book, a little, little book, I don't remember the guy's name, but he was an evangelist. We would call him today a faith healer. His last name, ironically, was Price, who ministered in the 20th century, I think mostly in the first half of the 20th century, and God healed thousands and thousands of people through him. And I remember in reading what he wrote, how the things that he wrote don't sound like the name it and claim it camp that you would expect him to come from. Because he said... After years of doing this, after seeing thousands of miraculous healings, the part that doesn't make any sense that I can't explain is all these people who will come forward at the end of a meeting, they are praying, they are in need of miraculous healing. And he's saying, you know, I'll pray for one after another. And he said, it, it's so, it feels so random that here's one person, they're believing God, they're holding on to the promises of God, they're quoting scripture, God's going to do it, I'm holding it to his promises today. And he said, and I'll pray for them and I'll know as I'm praying. There's nothing for them tonight. It's not going to happen, and I don't observe anything that happens. And he said, I'll pray for the next person, and they're not really bringing anything that you can observe to bear. They're just like, well, I just came forward, I'm sick, and here's the problem. And it is so clear that God is going, but they're going to get it tonight. And I'll pray for them, and in a moment, they're miraculously healed. And he's like, I wish I had a better formula to offer you. Sovereign God decided tonight that this person is going to be healed and this person is not. It's troubling, isn't it? I mean, at some level, it, it's a little bit troubling, and yet it is reality that there is a God who is over all things. And if we want to operate in the supernatural, we're going to have to learn to discern what God is saying and what he is doing. And when we step into that, we'll see supernatural things happen. Now, we can either get hung up on the human side of that and go, but we need to understand. We need a good explanation of why this happens and why this does not. Or you know what we can say is that's beyond me. God's ways are beyond me figuring out. I just need to be obedient to walk into what God has for us. And when we, when we do that 
and we learn to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit, look out. And Jesus said, it's just how I live my life every day. Today's agenda, I'm going to see what the Father has for today, and I'm going to walk into that. Second passage is Mark chapter 1. We're, we're backing up in time a little bit here in Mark 1. If you're not familiar, Mark's gospel doesn't start like, say, Luke or Matthew, which they're going to take some time to introduce who Jesus is and his genealogy and the story of Jesus arriving. Mark is the, the written account of Peter's preaching. And Peter's a, he's a prophet. He's a cut-to-the-point guy. So he just, you know, stepping into the beginning of Mark is like stepping on a moving freight train. You'll get whiplash. It's just Jesus, whew, the story. And, I mean, you're, you're in the middle of the story. So in Mark 1, we're not setting up his life. We are in the middle of his, you know, his ministry has been launched. And so Jesus is already demonstrating the realities of the kingdom. He's healing people. He's casting out demons, and he's gone into Capernaum. And in Capernaum, as they're doing this, word spreads, and it's not a huge community, but suddenly people from all around are flocking in because word has gotten out. There is somebody who has the power of God, and he's doing the miraculous. And so more and more people are coming in. And the question at hand now is, how do we proceed this thing that's just gotten started, the disciples have just started following Jesus, and you know they've just formed this tight little pack. And I love how in um, the Chosen, if any of you, those of you who've watched the Chosen, I love how they depict this because the apostles don't really understand what they've gotten on board with, and they certainly don't understand where it's going. But they they have a real clear sense of we're supposed to connect as many people as we can with Jesus, our leader. And so, and in The Chosen, they do a great job of focusing on Peter and how Peter's trying to help make this happen. And so, as soon as they get a following, you know, Peter's like, all right, Jesus, you know, we got a campaign going on here now. It's almost like, you know, we need to get some billboards. We need to, to attract some more people. We, we got a movement happening now. But, you know, whether that's accurate or not, you have to know that in the hearts of the apostles in general, that they're like, they're getting excited in Capernaum. It's like, yeah, now it's going on. We're going to build a name. We're going to build a brand. We're going to... We're going to build something here. Maybe we need to rent the stadium. We're going to get a real crowd in this place because it's happening in Capernaum. The thing that's easy for us to fail to recognize is when Jesus came to earth, he didn't come to earth self-aware. He came to earth as an infant who didn't know how to speak, who didn't know his own name. He had to learn everything along the way. That's part of the whole thing of stepping out of his role in heaven and becoming fully human is he had, he had to discover along the way that he was indeed the sinless Son of God, that he was the, the promised Messiah, that he was the Savior of the world. But even in the recognition of that, what on earth does that look like? For 30 years, he's having to come to grips with, at some point, I'm going to have to go public and, and stop living in the shadows. But what does that look like? What is the nature of my ministry going to be? And now in Capernaum, it, at least from Mark's perspective, this seems to be like maybe the first place or one of the first places that his ministry is really getting traction. Okay, what is that supposed to look like? What, what does ministry look like for the Savior of the world? And the disciples are going, well, Jesus, we're thinking we feel pretty good about it. Let's get a bigger and bigger crowd. We'll start passing the plate. We'll, we'll really we'll give this thing a name and we'll, we'll make it. The kingdom of God can start right here, right now. But recognize that in the middle of that, Jesus is still wrestling with the fundamental questions. What's my ministry supposed to look like? And what does the Father have for today? So in Mark 1, that's the moment. That's the dilemma. And we pick up in verse 35 where it says the next morning, the next morning after what? The next morning after Jesus just healed and delivered a bunch of people. L let me tell you what you can expect the next morning. I know this from firsthand experience. Whatever the crowd was yesterday, it multiplies tomorrow. Our trips into East Africa that we've taken in past years, I've seen this on, a, on some scale because we, we would go into really, really remote areas, deep into the bush, and we would set up our base camp always in a place that would have a teeny tiny little school. You'd wonder why there was a school there because there's, usually there's no village. It'd just be like a little three or four room block building with just you know, no glass in the windows and just really, really crude. 
And we'd spend a week in each of these places back in the bush. And we've come to bring medicine, doctors, pharmacists, Bibles, and the gospel through the Jesus film to these people. And so every time we've done this, and I've had an opportunity to do it a number of times, each time you start out looking around going, I think we're probably going to minister to about five people here because you just, as far as the eye can see, it's like there's no one here. We could minister to some, literally some you know, giraffes and zebras. We can see them. We can't see people. But So you start out on the first day, and a few dozen at a time would show up, and you're like, wow, I don't know where these people came from. But by the time the day's done, you've ministered to 100 or 200 people on day one. And you're wondering, who are we going to minister to tomorrow? And you get up the next day, and you look around and go, oh, my goodness, I think there may be 300 people out here. And that just multiplies day by day. And by the time Friday rolls around, it is crazy. In fact, some of the villages that we ministered in, I can think of a couple in particular where things would just get out of hand by the end of the week. I mean, I, I can think of a couple of times where by Friday, word has gotten out that this is our last day there. These are people who have no access to medicine and doctors and, and the help that, that we've been able to bring in. And so massive crowds have arrived. And on a couple of occasions, the crowds would be so large and they so would just be a sea of people surrounding the building. And they are so desperate to get in that the crowd gets out of hand and begins to be at times kind of violent to where I've had to pull the whole team in the building. We've had to lock the doors close the wooden shutters and for a time just lock ourselves down and pray and allow our African counterparts to try and regain control of the crowd because the press is so great. There's just such, I, I'm not faulting anybody, there's such a sense of urgency. This is our only hope to get help, you know, for our sick child, for our sick mother or whomever. It gets really wild. So I, I'm just saying that as like a frame of reference for you go into a remote place and you offer help that's never been there before Day by day, it's growing. It's one of those moments for Jesus. He's ministered there for a little while. The crowds are just multiplying by the day. There's going to be a press of people this day. What are we going to do with this today? The next morning, Jesus woke up very early. He left the house while it was still dark, and he went to a place where he could be alone and pray. Later, Simon and his friends went to look for Jesus. They found him and said, everyone is looking for you. Can't you hear the urgency in Peter's voice? Jesus, don't screw this up. We got it going on. Don't mess it up. They're looking for you. What are you doing? We should go to, this is Jesus speaking now. Jesus answered, we should go to another place. We can go to other towns around here, and I can tell God's message to those people too. That's why I came. So Jesus traveled everywhere in Galilee, and he spoke in their synagogues, and he forced demons out of people. And oh, by the way, as a footnote to that, or as a, just an aside, Everywhere he went and did this, about the time a crowd would really start to pick up, he'd slip out of town and move on down the road. And most of the time, when he did something really miraculous to somebody when there wasn't a crowd around, he would say, right now, I need you to not tell anybody who did this. I need you to just sort of keep that under wraps because he understood how immediately just whoo, there would be this press of people around him. He didn't do it the way we would, would have done it, did he? I mean, don't you agree? Jesus didn't take the approach that we would have taken. Don't you know if we, if we just suddenly here started healing everybody who was sick, do you think that by this time next week you could fit them in this room? Let me tell you, you couldn't. You couldn't fit them in this building. Give it a month, we'd need to take over the whole shopping center. And if we operated by modern church thinking, we'd be trying to figure out how we could rent the Civic Center or Fairhope Stadium so that we could handle the crowd. And yet Jesus took a different approach and said, when the crowd starts picking up, that's when we need to move down the road and go to Loxley. And we're going to spend a little time loving the people in Loxley. And then when it's a big crowd pressing in on us, we're going to move on down the road to Citronelle or wherever. You know, it's, it's just how Jesus did ministry. Why did he do it that way? I'll tell you why. Because on that early morning, when he walked out, left everybody behind, and he went and got alone for a window of time and said, Father, wh what's the next plan? What next part of the plan? What's the next piece? The Holy Spirit showed him, you're not here to see how big of a crowd you can attract. 
actually what you're called to do is going to mean you're going to go from village to village to village. And every time it looks like you're really getting successful, you're really gaining traction, you're going to walk away and move to the next place where nobody knows you. It's just what you're called to do. And Jesus said, okay, we'll go today. And he went against everything that intuition would tell you to do, and he just followed the lead on that. What was he doing? He was living out what he said in John 5. The only thing I can really do today that's going to have any power in it is just whatever the Father shows me, and I'll walk in that. So what is the missional habit that we take away from this? Well, here it is. It's just the simple. The third missional habit is very different from the first two. The third one is this, that I'll commit to spend at least one period of time this week listening for the Spirit's voice. Now, I know the spiritual giants in the room may say, one? Aren't we supposed to do this every day? Yes, we do listen for the Spirit's voice every day, and hopefully we even take a little bit of time every day to listen. What I'm ta- talking about is a little bit different from that in terms of, of quality and quantity. If you want to do this more days than one, awesome. Go with it. I, I commend that. But the challenge is this. Let there be one time every week that you block out a chunk of time in your calendar and do it every week that you give yourself some time just to be alone and do nothing but just be still in the presence of the Lord and to allow the Spirit to wash over you, to fill you, and to have an opportunity to speak in your life. And to give some definition to that, I'm talking about giving yourself a block of time that at a bare minimum would be at least 20 to 30 minutes that you get to just relax in this. Now, I'm going to even go beyond that to just suggest this. I'm not trying to make this burdensome, but I want to be practical. I would encourage you, block off at least an hour. You don't have to do it for an hour, but block off at least an hour that's going to be uninterrupted so that you're not having to watch the clock to go, oh my goodness, I've only got five more minutes and I haven't heard anything yet. Give yourself the luxury of an hour every week to just be still and to press in for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Now, we're going to give some definition, further definition to that in a minute, but that's what the, the basic challenge is. It's to create a, a safe space to just listen for the Spirit's voice. But let's be clear, listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit in our modern culture, is a lot like trying to, to listen to a song that's playing low on the radio when you're in a busy, crowded coffee shop or something, where there's just all kinds of noise around you. It will cover up the thing that you're trying to listen for. So the challenge is to get to a place that you can remove as much of the noise and distraction as possible because noise just creates interference and static for us. Now, you, you may say... What does this have to do with missional living? Oh, it has everything to do with it. It defines the mission. It defines the mission and the manner that we engage in it. It gives us real specific direction for the mission. But it also helps to negate or overcome the two primary sins that will be mission blockers. The two two biggest sins that will defeat God's mission plan for us. And those two, as I've pointed out in your notes, the first one is the sin of fear. I'm not talking about the kind of fear that makes you afraid to go out and face the world or go into the marketplace or whatever. I'm talking about the kind of fear that comes from recognizing, ooh, I think God may be leading me to reach out to this person, to say this thing, to do this thing that's outside of my norm. And and I'm afraid, I'm afraid of, of looking weird. I'm afraid of what they might think if I say that. What are what are they gonna imagine my motives are what are they going to say about me what if what if i don't know how to answer their questions all the what ifs that make me want to go i don't i just don't think i can do that fear will keep us from stepping into what god has for us the other one is laziness when i say laziness i'm not talking about the sit on the couch all day and eat doritos kind of laziness that's not the thing that we're trying to to overcome here we're talking about the kind of laziness that will block us because there's this thing in us that just doesn't want to be bothered by having to reach out. And I mean, seriously, preacher, you really expect me to reach out to three people and bless three people this week? I've got a busy week. 
You think I'm going to have time to eat with three people this week? It's that, that laziness that says, you know what, i got to take care of me first. Instead of realizing that every single one of us are called to be on mission this week. Having a time that we get alone in the presence of the Holy Spirit and hearing his voice speak. Because, look, I get it. I don't have the power to engage you in missional living. I don't even have the power to make myself do it. It's only going to be the work of the Holy Spirit that's going to get me and you motivated and activated to really live this stuff out. And if we don't take time to get alone with God, just like Jesus had to do this, it's not going to happen. And we're, what we're talking about doing is something that goes beyond taking a little time for a quiet time each day. What we could say is this. The voice of the Spirit countermands our worst impulses. And our worst impulses are really kind of driven by fear and laziness. Bruce Demarest in his books, uh, Satisfy Your Soul, said this, A quieted heart is the best preparation for all of this work of God. I love how he talks about that. Now, all, all of this stuff that we're called to do, all this work of God stuff, how do we get to a place that we're motivated to do this? He says, a quieted heart that's been still in God's presence is the best way to prepare for this. But just recognize this. The easiest trap for every one of us to fall into when we block off time like this to be with God is for us to do the talking. If we're going to hear the voice of the Spirit, we're going to have to learn to shut our mouths. I am the biggest talker in the room. There's nobody in this room that can out-talk me. Not even, there's no woman in the room that can out-talk me. I can, I, I'm telling you, there's no, I, I am the biggest talker. And it's true in my prayer life. I talk too much. What we are talking about is the deepest, most powerful and profound part of, of a prayer life. Learning to close our mouths and be still in the presence of God. Extroverts, we wrestle with this. We struggle with this. We cringe at the thought of being quiet and listening for 20 or 30 minutes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, Let him who cannot be alone beware of community. He will only do harm to himself and to the community. Now Bonhoeffer was not trying to tell us, don't do community. He was just trying to warn those of us who are extroverts to recognize the danger of always gravitating to community where we're going to be able to talk and engage others, that we must learn the disciplines of solitude, of silence, and prayer. Our generosity, our hospitality, which introduce people to the realities of the kingdom, they must be fueled by these disciplines of solitude, of silence, and of prayer. Thomas Merton, one of the greatest writers of the faith in the last 2,000 years, said this, It is in deep solitude that I find the gentleness with which I can truly love my brothers, Solitude and silence teach me to love my brothers for what they are, not for what they say. If we can't spend one significant block of time alone in the presence of God, alone in the presence of a missional God, we will always live at risk of looking no different than our busy, self-centered, harried, hurried neighbors. So... From a practical standpoint, what does this look like? I want to just leave you with just five very straightforward, simple, practical things. Just move through these quickly. Just some practical guidance about what we're talking about. First of all, designate a set time. You're not going to connect with the Holy Spirit in the way that we're talking about on the run. Now, obviously, as you learn to do this, you'll learn to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice even when he's speaking to you on the run, but you can't get there without having these times. So Set the times. Block it on your calendar. Treat this as a precious time. I love knowing in advance, this is the, this is the day I'm going to get to do this. This is where I'm going to go. Have a set time and eliminate distractions. So I would encourage you in that. Have a place that you're going to do this. It may just be a room in your house where you can tune everything out. Maybe a place that you go to. My place this week that I went and did this was I went and got out on a boat in the bay. I'm like, I'm going to go far enough out that I don't have to worry about anybody. No one can reach me but Jesus and the Coast Guard. And thankfully, the Coast Guard left me alone. 
But for a couple of days in advance of that, just knowing that I had that blocked off on the calendar, I get to have an hour where nobody can get to me, and I'm just going to get to enjoy the presence of God. I found myself just looking forward to that days in advance. Block it off on the calendar and do whatever you have to do to eliminate distractions. All the things that would appeal to your senses, the, the sounds that you can hear. It may be something that shouldn't be a distraction, and yet it is. If a ticking clock distracts you, then go where there's not a ticking clock or get rid of the clock. If, you know, if there's a temptation, to, i gotta, I got to check and see if I've got an email or whatever. Turn off your phone, turn off your computer. Just get rid of the distractions. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, you should go into your room and close the door, then pray to your Father. He is there in the private place, and he can see what is done in private, and he'll reward you. Jesus had to take, doesn't say that he did it every day, but he had to take these times where he would go and just get completely alone. Thirdly, assume a comfortable position. This may seem obvious, but some people, I think, feel like that they have to get like on their knees or face to the ground or whatever to, to draw near to God. And I would suggest to you, while that's certainly appropriate in some of our times of prayer, I wouldn't suggest that for what we're talking about now. Get comfortable, but don't get so comfortable that you're laying in your bed. Like, don't, don't try and practice what I'm talking about in your bed with your head on your pillow, because I can tell you what's going to happen to me. That meditation is going to result in sweet dreams. I'm, I'm, you know, get comfortable, but just like get in a chair. Get, maybe just get in a, a palms open position to receive. Just, just get in a spot that you could stay in for... 20 or 30 minutes and not feel like I, I can't do this any longer. And, and here's what I would say about the, the reason I said, you know, getting a, a position that you could stay in for 20 or 30 minutes is this. I, there, there's no system to this. I'm just telling you from observation. You may feel really restless, especially early on in doing this. But at about the 15 to 20 minute point in this, something begins to shift. Something begins to happen. So don't don't speed past this. Don't go, I've been doing this for 15 minutes and I hadn't heard anything yet. Just give yourself time. Just stay where you are. Be still. Slow yourself down. Number four, consciously seek to let God in. Do not start by asking questions. Don't start by telling God what you need. He already knows what you need. This is a different time of connection with God. What we want to do is just start by just getting still and, and turning our hearts and minds attention toward God and welcoming his presence. And I'm going to give you a warning at this point. Satan hates this. He will oppose this. He's going to work hard to keep this from happening. He's going to seek to distract you from the outside, but I want to tell you what he's going to do on the inside. This is very predictable. In these moments, he is going to remind you of every reason that God should not want to draw close to you. You lousy, pathetic excuse for a Christian. Why would you think for a minute that God would draw close to you? God draws close to righteous people of which you are not one. I'm telling you, you expect that in this moment that God desires for it to be intimacy for you. You do not be surprised on the days when what you feel in that moment is a sense of guilt or shame or condemnation because he does not want you to go there. And you're going to have to press on through that and just remember that you are a child of God and there is nothing that God loves more than to just enjoy the company of his children. And so you let your mind go there. St. Teresa of Lisieux said this about what I just described. If you are willing to bear serenely the trial of being displeased, displeasing to yourself, then you will be for Jesus a pleasant place of shelter. I want to say that again because it's a really significant thought for what we're talking about. If you are willing to bear serenely the trial of being displeasing to yourself, then you will be for Jesus a pleasant place of shelter. Why does that apply to this? Because in the presence of God, not just because of the attacks of the enemy, but because of the holiness of God, we also become aware of our own sinfulness. And so a part of this is we have to be willing to press on through that part of becoming suddenly more keenly aware of our sin as we draw near to a holy God. And she says, if you're willing to, to deal with that, press on through that, oh, your heart will become a wonderful place for Jesus to dwell. But realize, outcome-oriented people, driven people who are always wanting to be able to check the box and say, this is what I accomplished, this is initially going to be very challenging for you. Because you're going to want to be able to quantify the results or 
say tangibly, this is what I carried away. This is what I learned. This is what God said. And the point is to experience the presence of God. It's not to check a box. It's not to satisfy me. Just letting his presence wash over you is a huge part of this. So just let it happen. Welcome that. Welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul said this about what the Spirit does. He said the Spirit, not content to flit around on the surface, dives into the depths of God and brings out what God planned all along. Whoever knows what you're thinking and planning except you yourself, well, it's the same with God, except that he not only knows what he's thinking, but he lets us in on it. You know what he's talking about there? He's saying when you just let yourself be washed over and filled with the Holy Spirit and you get still and quiet in his presence, guess what the Spirit does? This is the Spirit of God. He, he minds the depths of the heart and mind of the Father and of the Lord Jesus, and he comes and he fills you, and he actually lets the thoughts of God and the heart of God be known inside of you. And suddenly, boy, something begins to happen in the deepest parts of you that you can't change or manufacture and it begins to change who you are. And you emerge with a clearer sense of what really matters and what your mission is. And somebody on your heart that you're supposed to love and reach out to this week. And suddenly you begin to be more connected with the heart of God and the mission of God. But what about me when I'm over here squirming and going, I can't do this. I can't make my mind be still. My thoughts are going in a thousand different directions. Okay, just a couple of things about that. The goal here, we're not after Eastern meditation. Eastern meditation where you, you know, got to get rid of all of your thoughts. That's not the goal. God speaks in your thoughts, in the context of your thoughts. So don't go, can't think about that. Can't think about that. You're not swatting mental flies. Don't worry about it. It's okay to let thoughts pass through your mind. But as best you can, you're just going to try and quiet, not get rid of all thoughts. You're going to quiet your mind and center on the presence of God. It's helpful to use centering prayer during a part of this, during the early part of this. Centering prayer usually is using one word or one phrase or at the most one sentence to just help quiet your mind. So like my centering prayer for this week was just, it was actually the, the simple little course. I think we may have done it last Sunday. I can't remember for sure. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It was just that one line. That, that was just my centering prayer. I found myself from the time I woke up that morning just in my heart praying and singing that, just that one line. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And just into my meditation time that day, just come, Lord Jesus, come. You may just use the name of Jesus, as, just his name as your centering prayer. You may use the classic Jesus prayer, which is Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And just, it's not a mantra, it's just a centering prayer that helps to get our hearts just dialed into him. You may just use a simple phrase as your centering prayer for the day that's just, be still. Be still. Just quieting your heart in the presence of God. We're just using this as an opportunity to center in on Him. And then finally, coming out of this, any promptings that you got from the Lord, follow those promptings. James said it this way. Don't just listen and do nothing. When you only sit and listen, you're fooling yourselves. If God's given you something, the goal isn't here to come away with a list of things to do today. But you will find that many times after you've been alone in the presence of God, that you have a sense of, he put somebody on my heart. Or there's something that came to mind that I need to address. I like to have a piece of paper or my phone handy so that when I come out of this time, I can either type into my phone or scribble down on a piece of paper any specific impression so that I can act on that. Hey, don't be surprised if he brings to mind somebody you're supposed to eat with this week, somebody you're supposed to contact, somebody you're supposed to bless, somebody you're supposed to follow up on, check on. The goal here isn't to get a new list from God, but just as Jesus went and got alone with God and came away going, guys, it's time to break camp because I realized after I've spent some time with the Holy Spirit today, we're moving on. we got a new village to go to today. The goal isn't, God, fill in the blanks for me today so I know where to go, but understand that is going to come out of these times. Are you open to pressing into something new and deeper with the Holy Spirit than maybe what's been true in the past? I want more, don't you? Yes. Let's stand together in the presence of the Lord and pray. Oh God, we long for more of the fullness of your Spirit working in us. and We long for more 
of, of intimacy with you and knowing your voice. And so we ask you to teach us. Take us to school. Teach us to learn how to respond to the voice of your Holy Spirit. Help us to recognize the times and the places that that would work. Why don't you just... Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.